Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empowering Neurologist. Today's program is really very special for three reasons. First, this is our 100th program, so we're very excited about this uh, numerical milestone, if you will. Uh, second, uh, always exciting to have Dr. Austin Perlmutter join us. So he's going to be joining in on our conversation today with our number three very exciting uh, guests. We have two guests who will be joining us. And uh, how this all uh, came to pass is uh, one of our wonderful research assistants, Kate, uh, decided to send us a, an article recently entitled The Neurobiology of Social Distance, uh, appearing in Trends in Cognitive Sciences. And this may sound compelling by the title, but it really is a wonderful review article that focuses on the importance of social interaction for us as humans across a variety of uh, disciplines in terms of health, uh, physical health, uh, certainly mental health, achievement, cognitive development, cognitive preservation, immune function. Uh, a variety of areas were reviewed in this article. Uh, very, very interesting. So we decided to reach out to the authors and invite them on the program. Uh, we heard back from them very, very quickly, and uh, how exciting that they're going to join us today for our 100th uh, episode of The Empower Neurologist. Let me tell you uh, a little bit about uh, our guest today. In addition to Dr. Austin Perlmutter, we will have Dr. Uh, Danilo Pstock, who is a, an MD, medical doctor, among other uh, titles that you'll learn about in just a moment. That is his training. He has a unique uh, dual background uh, in systems neuroscience and machine learning statistics. After medical training in Germany, uh, as well as at um, Lausanne in uh, Switzerland and Harvard Medical School, he completed a PhD in social effective neuroscience, and then High Achiever went on to uh, uh, obtain another PhD in machine learning statistics um, in France. And he currently serves as associate professor at McGill's a faculty of medicine, as well as chair at the Mila Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute uh, in uh, Montreal, uh, Canada, including cross appointments at the McConnell Brain Imaging Center, Montreal Neurological Institute, Ludmer Center for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health, and the School of Computer Science at McGill University. His interest uh, that we're going to explore today uh, focuses on the human social brain and its intimate relation to mental as well as physical wellness. Uh, he is joined and was joined uh, in the article that, uh, the review article that I mentioned above, um, by uh, Dr. Robin Dunbar, professor of evolutionary psychology at the University of Oxford, as well as emeritus fellow at, at uh, Magdalen College and an elected fellow of the British Academy. His principal research areas uh, include uh, looking at the evolution of social interactions uh, with particular reference to the social interactions when studying primates uh, as well as humans. Uh, he's uh, best known for the uh, popular, uh, popularization of the term uh, social brain hypothesis as well as his work in looking at the gossip theory of language evolution uh, and Dunbar's number, which you may have heard about. That's the limit on the number of relationships that we can uh, successfully manage in our lives. We're going to certainly talk about that. He has authored some uh, 15 academic uh, books and nearly 550 uh, scientific articles. Books include How Many Friends Does One Person Need, as well as The Science of Love and Betrayal. So what uh, an exciting program we have in store today. Can't wait. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're very excited about the program. Uh, and I just uh, want to start off by, again, thanking uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Stor uh, Stork and Dr. Dunbar for joining us uh, on our 100th uh, episode of The Empowering Neurologist. This is a time when we are told that we need to socially distance for our own health uh, and well-being. And yet, in uh, your recent paper that we uh, reviewed, it, it seems like uh, being socially connected is is vital for for our survival. So let me just throw this out there for uh, wh whichever whomever of you wants to to begin. Why is it important that we remain socially connected? Well, I guess I might start on that at least. And the short answer is 
you know, it's just a reflection of the fact that we belong to the monkey and ape family, you know, whose main evolutionary um, uh, strategy has been to develop this incredibly tightly bonded social lifestyle. Um, it's there to provide buffering for you against all the stresses that the world throws at you, the stresses that uh, come from living in crowded social environments even. So, you know, actually it's the beginning and the end of uh, uh, life <laughs> for, for humans uh, because that's the nature of our major adaptation, really. The, um, you know, these days, uh, it seems like our imposed isolation, if you will, this imposed loneliness uh, might actually fan the flames of, of more problems for us in terms of compromising immune function. So how do you see this uh, playing out uh, right now in terms of the situation that we're in? And I'll just, for our viewers, know that, you know, look at the date stamp on this, uh, on this podcast because it is during, you know, the early stages, I would say, of this coronavirus infection pandemic. I'll leave that well, one yeah. to you, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so there's a lot of ways in which humans connect to each other. And what, what I find compelling is that there's probably few people in the first world right now um, that have a memory of what is good to do or happen between massive social isolation during a pandemic. And so maybe these days there are, very different means in place that humans interact with anyways, like especially modern social media, modern means of communication. And what we found repeatedly, and what we also mentioned in our review, is that the structure of the social networks at all layers, they're actually uh, surprisingly similar in the digital world <clears throat> as they are in the real world. And so even if there are measures that are imposed by the states um, or local governments that um, force people to have less real-world physical interaction, that doesn't mean that people stop interacting with friends, families, work colleagues, and communities. So I think it'd be helpful for viewers, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but to differentiate between isolation, social isolation, and loneliness. Sure, yeah. Oh, I, I mean, Robin? Go ahead. Go ahead, Daniel. Well, yeah, so so I'm going to give like the, 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 the very important distinction, and that is really that loneliness by nature is something that is much closer to a feeling or a sense and it's highly subjective. So you literally have to ask a given human being, do you perceive yourself to be disconnected, not well socially embedded? and that is very different from objective measures of the intensity, frequency, quality of social interactions. Um, so objective social isolation does certainly not equate with the perceived social isolation. And loneliness is really about the perceived social isolation. Yeah, I um, think there's a the things you know, nicely oh, highlighted. Sorry, but I was going to say, I think it's sort of this point is sort of nicely highlighted by the sort of contrast between what you would find in uh, small scale communities, even, you know, a, a, a small village in the Midwest or somewhere uh, like that, where everybody knows everybody else and, you know, everybody sort of look, helps to look after each other, if you like. And I think it, in those sort of environments, which is the kind of traditional environment in which we've spent most of our history, of course, um, you know, it, it's, it's, really an intensely social environment and and the sense of isolation that you get is minimal and our problem if you like is sort of living in these enormous cities and conurbations where it's possible to be surrounded by literally millions of people but to be utterly lonely utterly isolated not know anybody and that's partly because uh friendship the opposite if you like of loneliness is a a, 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 a two-way process. You know, it's not enough for me to want to uh, be your friend. You have to be willing to make room for me. So, you know, we all have busy lives these days. So along you come, perhaps as a newcomer to to our street in the middle of New York, and uh, 
um, I just don't have, you don't have time sort of to set aside for me because for you to do that, you'd actually have to sacrifice some other friendship uh, in my favor. So you know, it becomes difficult to meet people. It becomes difficult to engage with people in, in those kind of large, busy conurbations, I think. And that's what produces loneliness. Well, you uh, mentioned in, in your paper that it, it, there's a, almost a finite, but at least a, a ballpark estimate of the amount of time and investment that, that needs to happen to cultivate a, a relationship from a perfect stranger to being a, quote, good friend. So it, it's, it's some effort and it's some dedication to making that happen, and yet there's value to it. Yes, I mean, it, this, this is not our work in particular, but somebody else actually prompted, I think, by, by, by the research that we've done, um, tried to have a look at how much effort is actually involved in uh, creating uh, a, not necessarily perhaps an intimate friendship, but a, a good friendship uh, out of a complete stranger. And uh, the estimate that came back out of that was something like 200 hours of face-to-face -face time over a period of three months. It was an enormous investment. And that bears out kind of what we found, which is that the quality of your friendships really is very, very dependent on how much time you invest in them. And it doesn't seem to matter too much how that's done, although face-to-face -face is always better. Um, but sort of for your closest kind of five, what I call shoulders to cry on friends, so the, the ones that are going to support you and come to your aid when your world falls apart, they require contact at least once a week is the absolute minimum. If you see them less often than that, they will drift down through the sort of rankings of your friends and end up at the bottom within, you know, a matter of a couple of years, perhaps, but end up relentlessly as just an acquaintance. There's somebody I once knew that I can, can't remember now much about. So as medical doctors, my dad and I talk a lot about pre-existing conditions that increase our risk of developing things like chronic diseases. And as you're describing this, this loneliness pandemic that we're experiencing even before coronavirus came into play, I wonder, could you speak a little bit more about where you see our social interactions as having changed over the last several decades and maybe how that might influence our immunity and even predispose us to having a worse time with something like the COVID pandemic, regardless of even our immune function, but just how well we're able to mentally process what is going on. I think at the social level, it's really just a, a, a sort of reflection of a move from a relatively static society, which kind of most communities were, relatively speaking, up until maybe the Second World War. What's happened since the Second World War, of course, has been cheap transport, cheap fast transport, and a much more kind of not so much globalized until recently, but certainly a much wider scale opportunity of, of employment. So people are moving much more than they ever did before. And I, what seems to have happened, I think, is that prior to that, people spent most of their lives, um, I mean, they might move two or three times during the course of their lives, but they spend most of their time embedded in a small community of a few hundred people, either in a village or in a little sort of couple of streets in a city. And then this mobility that we've had really over the last 50, 70 years has meant that we sort of wander around much more and spend a little bit of time, a few years here, a few years there, and you end up with a social network, your, your set of friends and family, as it were, who are just scattered all over the place in little clumps. And you're sort of Social network is, is a reflection of your travels through space and time with little sort of groups of people that you knew when you were at college uh, uh, at this particular place. And then when you moved to your job somewhere else, first job, to the little group of people that you got to know there, and then you moved on. So these groups of people don't know each other. They don't know your family, that's for sure. Um, they don't know each other. And so that sense of a highly integrated community, which kind of acts both as its own police force, but also its own social net, as it were, its support network, um, has just vanished. Your um, social networks are much more 
fractured, they're much more scattered over large geographical areas, and they don't have that kind of unity anymore. And I think that therein lies a lot of these problems, because it makes it very difficult to walk around the corner and just knock on somebody's door and say, you know, can I come in and tell you my problems? You know, um, the, 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 there's a very kind of robust rule in the sociology of this kind of area, which is called the 30 minute rule. Uh, that if somebody doesn't live within 30 minutes of you, uh, you're not going to make the effort to go and see them to build up these friendships. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter too much whether that 30 minutes is on foot, by bicycle, in the car, or whatever. Uh, it's 30 minutes. Uh, and that becomes important because it's the people, you know, you have to set these relationships up with these people before you need them. It's too late. <laughs> Once your world falls apart, it's too late. And I sometimes invite people to step out into the street when we're allowed to do it again <laughs> and sort of go to the first uh, stranger they meet and uh, throw your arms around them and say, give me a hug, my world's falling apart, you know, uh, uh, show some kindness. And, and I, my guess is anywhere in the world you try that, uh, the first thing they'll do is get their phone out and phone the ambulance service. <laughs> <laughs> or worse. Uh, Dr. Stork, I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, about one thing that the, the neurobiology of social distance uh, really brought to mind uh, was that you you both described uh, seemingly good or great value of social interactions that are digital, that are virtual, uh, which I think was a bit surprising to read. But um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is, I think, the conclusion that you drew. Um, yes, absolutely. So um, when you look at how social interaction is represented in the human brain, um, one of the first important distinctions there is whether or not um, people are meeting uh, in the real world in an immediate physical encounter or are, for example, uh, having a phone call without visual representation of the other. And so there's also an interesting and compelling evolutionary psychology or anthropological explanation to this, and that is that Darwin himself already thought that the human face may actually be an evolved adaptation to transmit information between human beings in a very fast way. So as far as I know, um, just the, the muscle, the number uh, of muscles we have to control our face exceeds that of pretty much any other species on the planet. And so decisions, even more complex things, not only kind of fear, disgust, basic emotions, but even more mm -hmm. complex social judgments of like trustworthiness or attractiveness, those are really kind of um, in a dozens of millisecond scale. So first of all, it's important to acknowledge that faces are really a key driver of human social interaction or primate societies more broadly. And so this is an important component of what you observe in the brain um, when humans interact. Um, this is also why, just to kind of close the circle, um, the types of social interaction in the digital world that tend to be perceived as um, satisfying, being quality time. Um, it's those, uh, as we are having now, such as Zoom and other things that have a visual component. So there's other aspects in the brain that have complicated and interesting relationships to social behavior, but we really think that um, this visual component is a key aspect, especially now. And then you you talked about how uh, in then in written language in text uh, that this might have been the reason that we now use emojis just to further nuance the the message by give, by giving a kind of a facial expression to our written language. And this is true, actually. I mean, we just run some uh, experiments um, looking at how much people information people get out of the just the auditory. Uh, component of the the uh, 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 speech, as it were, without hit necessarily hearing the words themselves, um, the phonetics of it, 
uh, in terms of the quality of the relationships between two people. And it's massive. <laughs> you, people are pretty much 80% uh, accurate as uh, when hearing just these kind of the vocal channel, as it were, without the, without the actual words in figuring out the quality of the relationship between two people as if they hear the words themselves. The words give us relatively little information. And I think kind of just to em you know, emphasize what Danilo is saying, the, the, uh, you know, something peculiar about being able to see somebody's face, uh, uh, the, the information you get out of it is really extraordinary. Um, and so while kind of text-based media are okay, I, I kind of see them as sticking plasters to keep things going when you can't actually get together, but they're never going to stop relationships decaying quietly um, if you don't meet up now and again and stare into each other's eyeballs. And I think that, that becomes terribly important. And I think that's where these kind of video-based environments are, are sort of winning out, if you like, because you might not be wanting to do that with 400 people uh, on the line, whereas you might be happy singing with 400 people. Uh, you know, our, our kind of um, not in person, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but our, our our conversational level uh, uh, exchanges, as it were, and getting to know people really well really depends on these close face to face interactions. So I'd like to ask a little bit more about the kind of pathophysiology and how that relates to brain processes. Uh, in loneliness, because we know that loneliness, as you elaborate on in your paper, is linked to all of these negative health outcomes. So I think for, for listeners, it'd be helpful to understand, is it uh, mainly a function of the amount of time that we spend lonely that then correlates with changes in our brain and some of these health outcomes? Or do you think it's the intensity of the loneliness? And then on the other end, especially as we come out of the worldwide isolation that has accompanied COVID, do you see this as a process that can be quickly reversed? So as soon as we're able to regain our social connections, we're able to perhaps immediately see those changes in brain function and subsequent to that, see improvements in those associated negative health sequelae? There really seem to be kind of three aspects of a question. So the first is like, how is loneliness related to the brain? How is it related to the body? And is it reversible, right? Sure. And so maybe starting out with this first one, um, a key reason why I really wrote this review um, is that there's actually a surprising, surprisingly low number of original articles and research on how loneliness affects the human brain in particular. So uh, there's a handful of studies. So this is actually an under-researched area. Um, and this is why many of the questions you, you just asked, they're, they're actually difficult to answer for the human being at this point in history. It's a different story for monkeys, rats, mice. In these species, where we can do very different type of experiments, uh, more invasive, and so on and so forth, we have much more knowledge of how episodes of social isolation impact the brain. In humans, there's, there, there's little. So some of the things we know about the human brain uh, and its relation to loneliness is that it tends to relate to those brain systems that some psychologists like to interpret as representing a kind of constant attention to threat. Um, and there again, there's an evolutionary psychology story to it. Um, some people think that a lonely individual is uh, somebody who will be stressed because there's a lot of distress from their perception of being socially excluded or expecting to be socially excluded. Because if you think about um, the fact that what makes the human species most different from any other species, if that truly is the complexity and richness of social interactions, um, then it, it would make sense that taking this away or people thinking that they are kind of taken out of the social web has important consequences, such as kind of having a constant stress response. And so 
I would say um, the most prominent psychologist who studied this area, John Cacioppo, in his work on the human brain, he very much emphasized um, the st stress circuits and kind of the interpretation as really existential threat. So that's that's what I wanted to say about the human brain. Yeah, and you know, in in the the article that we've been talking about, uh, I thought it was really fascinating, and that you you showed that social isolation uh, was associated with less uh, connection to and perhaps activation of the prefrontal cortex. And in uh, the book that Austin and I uh, co-authored, uh, we really talk about the fundamental importance of this relationship between the prefrontal cortex in terms of modulating the amygdala in terms of its perceived fear activity, et cetera. So I think that, um, you know, we get that and we, you know, that it's really such a powerful argument about cultivating social integration, or as you said, um, building our, our social capital, uh, in, uh, in your, uh, TEDx talk, you talked, uh, about the fact that there are, uh, measurable changes in activation in primate brain based upon the number of uh, individuals that they interact with. And I would suspect that, and there may be human studies, maybe you can tell us about that, but I certainly would expect that that's uh, something we would expect to see in, in humans. Um, absolutely. So that, that is really a question about um, social interaction. So if you think about uh, social deprivation, it's pretty much the extreme of the social interaction intensity and quality. And so that has been investigated in primates um, by uh, colleagues of Rome Dumbers uh, in Oxford. And they found that if you take monkeys and you put them in cages like alone with one companion, up to seven companions, then after a couple of weeks, so and this is a causal conclusion, which is harder to obtain in humans or has not been studied to the same extent. After a couple of weeks, there are volume adaptations, plasticity effects in distributed parts of the brain, including the prefrontal cortex. So I might uh, add to that, go in ahead, humans, Austin. we've done a number of um, neuroimaging studies in humans looking at, uh, and uh, probably about half a dozen other studies beyond ours that have been done now. Um, just looking at the volumes of some of these brain areas in relation to the number of friends people have. And certainly in all these studies, I think, the, the front, uh, uh, prefrontal cortex comes out as really important, particularly either the uh, orbital frontal or the ventral uh, uh, medial uh, prefrontal cortex correlates really quite surprisingly strongly with the number of friends people have. Now, you know, this may reflect your past history, um, I hesitate to say that these things are completely fixed, in other words, but it probably reflects the social experiences you've had over the course of certainly growing up and, uh, uh, and uh, early adulthood, um, where, the, where the neurons, if you like, are kind of building the capacity to handle um, uh, friendships. But probably by the time you get to our age, I'm afraid you're stuck with what you've got. And, uh, you know, that really does limit, limit the number of friends you can handle at, at any one time. You mean cognitively, the cognitive reserves yes. to be yes. able to, yes. Yeah, and, and I mean, there might... are, yeah, there are two key components to this, you have to remember. And this really just reflects our primate heritage, because this is how primates in general organize their social relationships. It's a kind of two process business. The one process is this cognitive constraint. It's not about memory. It's not a memory constraint per se. It's about figuring out what's going on in somebody else's mind and understanding how another person, a friend obviously, would react to something you say or would want to do their likes and dislikes and, and sort of integrating your uh, 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 likes and dislikes into their likes and dislikes, it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, those, those kind of really complex calculations. And then underpinning that is, is this time component, which really um, is the core to primate um, uh, sociality. In primates, it takes the form of social grooming, where they sort of sit leafing through each other's fur and, uh, uh, and stroking uh, and picking out rubbish 
uh, bits of leaves and, and so on. Um, and that seems to trigger the endorphin system in the brain. So you've got the brain operating at two separate levels. You've got this sort of quite conscious level component up in the prefrontal cortex. And then somewhere deep down, uh, you've got the endorphin system being kicked in by stroking. And we still do that. I and mean, we've done neuroimaging experiments and shown very nicely that if uh, you are stroked on your torso, um, the, the brain sort of is absolutely kicking out endorphins like crazy and the endorphin receptors are just absorbing this stuff all over the brain practically. The, um, the, you know, the, the mention of the importance of understanding through social interaction the, the hierarchy of the community, uh, I think it's something that Dr. Robert Sapolsky explored you know, quite a, mm. a long time ago with uh, uh, imaging and uh, uh, post-mortem analysis of primate brains, showing that those subordinate versus the ordinate uh, males uh, clearly demonstrated significant changes in terms of uh, the areas that we've talked about in addition to uh, the hippocampus. So one wonders if there is, what is the positive from an evolutionary perspective aspect of this hierarchy if those who are subordinate then uh, experience this less favorable brain physiology, brain anatomy. I mean, why would that necessarily be good for the group that we have subordinates who have that pathology? Well, it, I guess the, the answer to that question really is, is what the nature of primate sociality altogether. It's uh, individuals essentially grouping together in what's essentially an implicit social contract to solve key problems of survival and successful reproduction. Those key problems largely have to do with protection against predators uh, or protection against neighboring rival groups that, that m might be threatening your access to, to resources. So the group, the group is forming essentially is for reasons of self-protection. Um, uh, your choice, if you like, uh, face of this situation uh, is either you leave the group or you mm -hmm. stay in the group. It's as simple as that. So if you want to make take the benefit of, of having the protection offered by the group, you've got to find some compromise that you're happy enough with uh, for staying in the group, despite all these stresses. So there's no question right the way through primate, all primate species, the big problem they're trying to deal with is the stresses of living together in close proximity, right? This is, you know, well, you know, this is no different to living in New York with, with, with the subway and all the stresses and pressures you get of people jostling you when the, when the subway is crowded. Um, uh, and all of primate social evolution is about finding that balance and finding solutions. Now, for primates in general, the key buffer they evolved to handle that stress and mitigate that stress is friendships that's their grooming partners they just keep everybody mm. off your back just enough so that they don't kind of mess you up too much uh, but you're not driving them away uh, which is the risk that you otherwise run because it's a very fine balance that you've got to maintain and that's why actually primate social groups are so cognitively complex for the animals to handle. They're actually engaged in a very, very complicated balancing act between not driving everybody away. So you end up with a group of two, which is the danger. If, if you're too dominant and you bully everybody too much, everybody's just going to go, <laughs> leave you to it, and, and find a more congenial group to live somewhere else. Um, uh, and the fact that you you want to be have a, be surrounded by others because they provide help provide you with protection against predators. So, and that's true, you know, for humans. <clears throat> uh, you know, the group still provides that sort of defense against the threats of life. Obviously, there are not so many predators for us <laughs> to worry about uh, these days in 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 the industrialized world. Anyway, um, but still, you know, um, the generalized sort of threats that, 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 that make life difficult for us. And having that support network on the wider scale for when times get tough um, and your world falls apart just become very important. I think that's such a helpful conceptualization of um, humans and groups and how we rely upon each other as 
almost nodes in this larger circuit mm -hmm. where we each serve different purposes. Um, I'd love to just for a moment get back to what we were talking about. And this is, I guess, a question for both of you. So you had mentioned the idea that stroking is associated with changes and observable changes in brain patterns. And so question of how exogenous stimuli change our brain function and how that relates to, I guess, our central topic today, which is the loneliness architecture. And we actually had a, a really interesting conversation a couple of weeks back with uh, Dr. Ingmar Gordon, Gorman. He was a, uh, he's a MDMA researcher in New York, and he's using it for PTSD. And so we talked about how MDMA as an empathogen actually impacts some of these same functional connectivity patterns that we're talking about as related to loneliness and how it, it may actually improve social interaction. And then I also think about how people are using transcranial magnetic stimulation to preferentially activate regions of the brain that are involved with depression. And so I guess my question again for both of you is, do you see a, uh, a future in which we are using, maybe not these exact examples, but these exogenous stimulation devices in order to either activate or deactivate patterns in the brain that are associated with loneliness? Um, okay, so if I put my MD head on, what I will say is that's experience from working in a department of psychiatry in Germany, where I was an assistant professor for the last four years. Um, there is um, kind of non-invasive electrical stimulation means that um, in certain parts of the world have kind of a comeback right now. So I'm not a practicing a clinician, but um, what I did notice is that um, in certain major psychiatric conditions, for example, depression, schizophrenia, um, there is kind of a comeback of using maybe um, kind of electrical stimulation from outside in, in cases where a lot of different treatment options have not worked. And so that's one example, uh, something like that may perhaps also be a useful solution for, for other conditions, such as kind of loneliness. I'd like to, uh, Dr. Dunbar, ask you if um, it's maybe, a, uh, let me preface it first of all by saying that I, I'm feeling very much uh, in, um, uh, less socially isolated, even though we're having this wonderful digital uh, interaction. It is digital, but it's making me feel good. But beyond that, if we look around the world and see what's going on right now with um, increased uh, uh, tribalism, borders closing, us versus them mentality, I think it's become pretty obvious that we're seeing sort of a trend. Uh, what role does this pervasive and ever increasing uh, uh, social isolation uh, issue that you well described, what role do you think that has uh, its playing in terms of what we see now happening globally. Uh, okay, actually, let me let me just step back uh, one moment and add a comment to, to to the previous question because I actually think it's really quite interesting. In, 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 you know, and actually, of course, it's about mental health and stuff. It's really uh, a, a major a matter of major importance. Um, and I'm kind of tempted to say, under that context, is that we we already have the medikit. Uh, under our belts, it's there uh, 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 because although the way primates build their relationships is through social grooming, and we still kind of use that with our nearest and dearest, you know, stroking and patting and cuddling and hugging and all these kind of things. Um, clearly, we don't like uh, sort of cuddling people who are not um, very close uh, to us emotionally. So what seems to have happened is we've developed in the course of uh, recent, relatively recent human evolution, like a lot of these are historical rather than, than, than sort of genetic, if you like, we've discovered lots of ways of triggering the endorphin system that's triggered by grooming uh, without having to physically touch each other. So it's like virtual grooming at a distance. And these mm -hmm. have been laughter, singing, dancing. Um, the rituals of religion happen to be very good, if you like that kind of thing. Uh, Eating socially uh, and so on. These these all trigger the endorphin system. So my solution to this problem, uh, if you like, is uh, uh, chuck the drugs. Just go and sing. You know, sing around the campfire. That's 
the best thing you can do. And it's extraordinary the effect it has on people because um, we, we actually call it the icebreaker effect because you just have to put complete strangers, uh, if you like, round the campfire uh, to sing, you know, old folk songs and, and anything like that, you know, jolly stuff. And at the end of it, they'll come away as though they've been lifelong friends. It's quite amazing. And people who sing regularly in choirs, who obviously take these things much more seriously, they, they will tell you that's exactly the feel you get. It's this wonderful uplift you get from it. It seems to be really fast and furious from singing. So I, I'm a great fan of, if you like, communal singing is the solution <laughs> to all our ills. I think I a know very what good... comes next in our time together today. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there's, there's a, you know, there's, that's the sort of social side to it, and that's really good. But it turns out that endorphins trigger the uh, 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 release of, uh, trigger the immune system, and particularly uh, trigger the release of natural killer cells. Um, so actually, you know, you're getting the benefit both ways because the endorphin is a give system is giving you this kind of uh, happiness and contentedness and making you feel kind of more trusting and, and less stressed. And at the same time, you're getting a, this little boost to your immune system, which is clobbering all the bacteria and what have you that, 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 that constantly seem to want to invade our poor, humble bodies. Um, so, you know, I, mean, I think there's no, no better solution to a lot of this kind of stuff than, than, than social singing in, in, in the good old fashioned way. And I think, you know, what has been very striking, I think, in the course of lockdown um, is the, the extent to which people have got out on their balconies and sung. Now, you know, I, I, I realize this is kind of difficult if you happen to live in the Midwest where people have big gardens and wide streets. But I guess the, the people who are going to luck out on this one is, is those living in their tenements in, in New York and the big, the big urban centers where they can lean out of their windows and, and have a good old street sing song. But anyway, you know, back, back, back. Sorry. Well, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I guess we need to get back to the original question, which I probably I was going to get. My yeah, I was, I was going to come back now then to, to your question. And I think uh, <clears throat> I, I'm kind of torn two ways here because. Uh, my perception really is that our, our real social world is very, very small. You know, that's what really counts to us in the end. I mean, you know, uh, the, the butterflies flapping in the Amazon, you know, may proverbially have consequences for what happens for us here in terms of storms or hurricanes or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, that's so far outside our kind of real personal knowledge that it actually doesn't have much success. Uh, it, great impact, I think. I mean, what you want is just well-knit communities, and the rest of it is a matter of economics as much as anything in politics. Uh, so I'm much less kind of uh, uh, fussed about the fact that there's a sort of contraction going on. And there may be some benefit to come out of this, because I actually do think that part of the big problem that we, we face is simply that our political units, our, our states, are just far too big. You know, the, uh, the, the sheer size of most countries um, uh, is just far too big. So you guys in America are kind of lucky, and Canada is sort of has the same benefit. And, and, and in a way, Germany did too, with this federal system. You know, um, you have the states, and the states are your bedrock, really. The, the federal government in Washington, you know, does what it has to do and occasionally is a nuisance. But well, what really matters is what you guys do in your neighborhood. And, and I think that makes for a much stronger political structure. I think, you know, I think has been the great saving grace of the American particular structure in particular, because it has this kind of federal and state level system where you can have a much more local kind of, uh, uh, personalized, person-to-person -person, um, uh, 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 political activity and economic activity. Okay, you know, the government in Washington does what it has to do. <laughs> it's a way of keeping boys quiet, <laughs> uh, if nothing else. You know, Dr. one Dr. thing Hart. we've explored quite a bit on this program has been the notion of evolutionary mismatch, uh, which mm. I think underpins the pa so-called paleo movement of people trying to regain uh, a, a diet uh, that's more in line with, mm. our, with our genome and what our genome, let's say, expects uh, with physical activity, with chronobiology, 
uh, with reconnection uh, with nature, uh, engaging in enough restorative sleep, for example. And through that lens of this uh, evolutionary mismatch, I think what you guys have uh, been uh, exploring over the years uh, really is an indication that we're suffering consequences because of our the, the, you know, an increased social isolation, uh, which was really never uh, part of the of the story, it was never part of the yeah. <laughs> the recommendation, if you will. Yeah. Well, well, we see that in a, on a kind of small scale, I think, uh, and this is why I'm kind of hopeful that that maybe some better political structuring may come out of uh, the, this uh, episode of, uh, that we've been experiencing, as people rethink what's going on. But we've done a number of surveys uh, around the UK, so proper stratified national surveys. And what has been very clear about uh, all of those has been the, the more you engage in some local uh, social activity, be it going to your local church regularly, be it going out for social dinners with people, whatever it might be, the more friends you have, the more satisfied you are with your life, the happier you are, the less depressed you are, uh, the more engaged you are with, you, with your local community, and the more trusting you are of strangers in your community. You know, and I think that's part of being part of our problem in a way, is we've been pushed into these contexts where we've been sort of thrown into this huge, enormous world, which we're not really that well adapted to cope with in a social and, and perhaps a cognitive sort of sense. So I think if we kind of refocused our interests a little bit more on our local community as the center of our lives, actually, paradoxically, what you would then find is people who are uh, kinder to the world in general uh, and probably less, uh, less, less, less sort of took less aggressive stances than, than, than has been tended to be the case. Well, I'd love to pick both of your brains as far as the practical steps that people can take, given that so many people right now are experiencing loneliness and are perhaps experiencing some of the negative effects as it relates to their health. So I know we're talking about this bigger picture, perhaps Dr. Dunbar, as you just mentioned, moves towards community, moves towards more localized community. Um, but I'd love to just hear if, in addition to perhaps even the singing together, Either of you have insights as to what the average person who is experiencing loneliness right now might be able to do in addition to going on a video chat. Um, and also, I'd love to get your take on, you know, we talk about loneliness as a risk factor for these other problems, but are there things in our lives that predispose us to loneliness? I, I'm thinking back to a couple of studies, one from UCLA, where they looked at giving endotoxin to increase inflammation and that it increased feelings of social withdrawal after these volunteers had the injection. And then research from Matthew Walker, also in California, that showed that people who were sleep deprived had a uh, kind of a social contagion <coughs> loneliness where people looking at pictures or looking at videos of those who were sleep deprived felt lonelier. So I guess I'm just asking, if you had your, your recipe book or if you had your menu of all the different things that you can do to help improve symptoms of loneliness, would some of those things actually relate to lowering your risk for developing it in the first place um, through other factors and then what you can do once you already have it to start mitigating those symptoms? And just going to kind of try to contextualize this a little bit. And it's important to realize that uh, this is a maybe once in a century, once in a lifetime type of situation that probably nobody anticipated in this shape and form a couple of months ago. So that's one. Um, we don't have randomized trials with detailed information and causal relationships with the year-long longitudinal designs. Uh, this has not been expected, I would say by most scientists in my area, certainly. And so um, a lot of the questions you asked, they are really not a cross-sectional design. Most of the studies that we mentioned and that we also cited in our studies in humans, they tend to be cross-sectional studies. So that's one. There's just a technical difference in kind of how much insight and knowledge you can gain 
um, and what type of studies studies you can do. So I don't think that we have a lot of very detailed, robust knowledge what long-term consequences are on the human brain, on the human body uh, of loneliness in general. And as I alluded to before, but this is even more so the case because we're not talking about normal average loneliness, which is a problem, which has been recognized by the World Health Organization uh, that there's a major loneliness pandemic. But the type of mass social isolation synchronized multiple countries across the planet, that didn't happen in this form before. And this is why we do not have a lot of scientific articles that specifically have investigated this or could give principled recommendations. We can only kind of speculate and extrapolate from the hints that we have in the scientific literature. I want to get this back is, to... This is uh, true. Let, 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 oh, let sorry, me sorry. just... I'll just add a, a, a further comment on, on top of what Daniela said, which is perfectly correct. Um, and that is, you know, at the end of the day, these are short-term uh, situation that we're really in. I mean, you know, what's, what causes the damage... I don't, uh, defer to Daniela's greater knowledge on these things. But, but my feeling would be that what creates the kind of neural or, or cognitive or whatever um, uh, damage, if you like, uh, of isolation is really prolonged isolation. We're not yet in prolonged isolation. This is a couple of months, three months, and people will bounce back out of it just fine. I think if it went on for six months or a year, maybe it would be really quite serious. But we've, to be fair, we've been here in the past many, many times. It's just that nobody was alive when it happened last time. Right? The last one really was the Spanish flu. And, and, you know, with a lot of government encouragement of not to go sort of doing too much social and wearing masks. I had no idea that the government in California, you know, was, was in making people wear, wear masks outside in 1918, 19, just the same as uh, is happening now. And of course, the big one in Europe was the, and Asia, was the Black Death in the 1350s or whatever it was. And there was very serious lockdown, effect, effectively lockdown going on then because uh, one of the big problems they had with the flagellants who viewing the Black Death as a, a punishment for misbehavior from God uh, were going around from town to town and village to village uh, uh, flagellating themselves and singing hymns and psalms and stuff. And of course, they were spreading the disease <laughs> as they went. You know, this is a classic typhoid Mary problem. Um, and a lot of cities very quickly learned that uh, they just shut the gates and kept these people out and essentially shut the place down. You know, and we survived. We're still here. We still have culture. We're still talking to each other. <laughs> it's just, it's not just a compliment. <laughs> So just to compliment kind of the glasses half full perspective with the glasses, uh, the, the empty, now with the full perspective. And there, there is few studies in human brains with a, long, a longitudinal design. And so we know a few things. It's just that we don't have dozens of studies on this. And um, what's positive uh, that I can mention is that we do know that in a matter of weeks when humans do, for example, targeted training and really thinking about what other people may be going through in their mind, what their beliefs and tensions, potential rejections, these perspective taking, empathy type of tasks. We know very well that if if humans do this on a regular basis, it does induce changes in parts of the brain that in the normal situation are also believed to be responsible uh, for supporting these types of uh, kind of social interaction. So that would mean on the one hand that if the social interaction patterns change, such as from real world social interaction with colleagues to online social interactions like text messages and, and so on, um, it, and that's a speculation at this point, is it probably leads to adaptations in the human social brain. But at the same time, um, the few studies that we have in that space, they would also suggest that if you get back to normal, then you would also kind of revert to uh, the previous situation. 
I'd like to get back just a moment to um, a point Austin brought up a, a few uh, minutes ago, and that was the, the research showing that injection of endotoxin leads to uh, virtually self-imposed kind of isolation. And again, this is mimicking having an infectious disease. So might that be an evolutionary advantage for people who suddenly have some sort of infectious, possibly contagious disease, then to feel that they need to self-isolate? So maybe there's an upside to that type of isolation. Perfect question for Robin. I was going to say, I think this must be your territory. <laughs> okay, I think I mean, that's an interesting thing. Somebody's take, got right? to answer the question. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I thought you were going off in a different direction, and, and that's really kind of an interesting take. So it's a kind of natural um, uh, recuperation uh, preventative uh, uh, strategy, if you like, that's built into the system. That's a possibility. It, it makes a certain sense. And you know, when the body is ready to 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 have another go at life, uh, it, it 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 goes back on to to kind of normal functioning again, and you bounce back out and and off you go to uh, uh, a party and club and and theatre and what have you. And uh, yeah, well, it's possible. <laughs> I don't know if there's any. Do you know anything? Any evidence bearing on that, Danilo? I, I can well, only say that. So, so like some of the patterns that you mentioned, I know that there are some speculations in the psychology literature in terms of like disgust and emotion. So kind of some of these more physical kind of threats to the humans, like getting poisoned or something. Um, some people think that basic emotions even like disgust. And that could also mean that the friend who kind of brought this food just looked at that food, but then there's something wrong with that food. I can see it in the face, and that could inform me that there may be kind of a problem, um, a, a potential threat of ge like getting some form of food intoxication, for example. So that would be kind of a little, maybe a little remote, but a form of this type of neurocognitive adaptation that you're getting at. Hmm. Well, I can't believe an hour has gone by. This is, uh, I, I feel so much more socially connected. And uh, I'd like to say to everybody, thank you for, for spending time with us today. Thank you guys uh, sure. so much. And I hope thank we Thank you so much you. for inviting us to the 100th episode of your book. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I feel very privileged here. Yeah. We do too. I shall wait for the 150th, though. Uh, That'd be the let, special let's one. Do that. But are we going to end with a song? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you again. <laughs> we'll all talk soon. Very good. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Welcome. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Wow, what an incredible program. I think about it. Uh, you know, in this time when we are told that we've got to socially distance, it's really important as we learn today that social distancing does not mean we should be socially isolated. Uh, social isolation, you know, leading to loneliness looks like has some pretty profound uh, consequences for us and really runs in contrast to human evolution, whereby our social interactions, our social capital really has fostered our success as a species and certainly, as we've learned today, is really important individually uh, for our health. Thanks for joining us today on the 100th episode of The Empowering Neurologist, and we will be back soon. Bye for now.